I was just thinking it's so lovely to hear everybody chatting as we, as we come in, and it's so lovely to see everybody getting their cuppies and having a wee chat as we come together to worship God. And I was thinking, you know how you have all of these little kind of mother and child groups or parent and child groups, and it will say things like baby blather and things like that. Maybe we should talk, call this the talk with God time or something, whereby we're coming into God's presence, we're bringing in all that we are as well, because our whole lives are, are, are of an interest to God, but we're also coming to hear from God as well, to hear his word, to feel his presence. So we're going to start by singing a lovely little song, Christ is our light, the bright and morning star. And as usual, if you're more comfortable sitting, then stay seated. If you prefer to stand, that's entirely up to you. So let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we thank you that you continually show your presence in our world today. We thank you, Lord, that you do indeed shine your light into our lives and you bless us abundantly. Forgive us, Lord, when we are too busy and too distracted to see the things that you are doing. Forgive us when we give credit to everyone else and forget that you're the one who blesses. Forgive us when we are so wrapped up in our own concerns that we forget to cry out to you, to involve you in all that we do. And loving Lord, as we're here today, we ask that we would indeed know your presence, that we would indeed feel you moving amongst us, that you would touch us, that you would teach us, that you would lead us, that you would guide us. Help us, Lord, to be your people in your way, not some preconceived ideas that we have, but in your ways. And we ask your help in all things. And we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Folks, I'm going to read a little passage from the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. There's always a danger when we read scripture that we take things out of context. We just read the words in front of us and try to make the shoehorn them into where we are today. And so it's good that we know the background. And that's often why I take a few moments to explain what was happening at the time when these passages were written or what they were written about. God's people found themselves in exile. They had their holy city. They had the temple in Jerusalem and the holy city. And the Babylonian empire wiped them out pulled down the temple, pulled down the city walls, and all of the great and good were marched off into exile in Babylon. They were there for many, many years. Some were born there, some died there. And God had told them through the prophets to make their homes there. This wasn't going to be something that was over in a, in a year or so, to make their homes there, and he would prosper them right where they were. And Nehemiah he was doing okay. He had a very important job. He worked for the king. He was well regarded. However, his brother had gone back to Jerusalem, which was lying in a ruin. It was occupied then by other nations. Other people were living there. And there were some, a small number of Jews, who had gone back. But it was a ruin. And Nehemiah feels quite strongly that it was time that it was all rebuilt and has to ask the king for permission to go back and rebuild. He's not just going to need the king's permission to go. He's going to need a letter from the king to the people there as well. And it wasn't an easy task. There was a lot of opposition from some of the people who had made their homes there who weren't interested in what was there before. And there was a lot of work to be done. So we're, we're kind of further into Nehemiah. It's an interesting book to read. It's not a, a, a the longest book in the Bible. It's an interesting book to read. But today we're just focusing on this little bit. And it says this. So we went on rebuilding the wall. And soon it was half its full height because the people were eager to work. Salabat, Tobiah, and the people of Arabia, Ammon, and Ashdod heard that we were making progress in rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem and that the gaps in the wall were being closed and they became very angry. So they all plotted together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. But we prayed to our God and kept men on guard against them day and night. The people of Judah had a song they sang. We grow weak carrying burdens. There's so much rubble to take away. How can we build the wall today? Our enemies thought we would not see them or know what was happening until they were already upon us, killing us and putting an end to our work. But time after time, Jews who were living among our enemies came to warn us of the plans our enemies were making against us. So I armed the people with swords, spears, and bows, and stationed them by clans behind the wall, wherever it was still unfinished. I saw that the people were worried, so I said to them and their leaders and officials, don't be afraid of our enemies. Remember how great and terrifying the Lord is, and fight for your relatives, your children, your wives, and your homes. Our enemies heard that we had found out what they were plotting, and they realized that God had defeated their plans. Then all of us went back to rebuilding the wall. Amen. We're going to sing again a brilliant old hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory of the Coming of the Lord.
It would seem that over the summertime and right up until right today, that we've seen more and more and more of the impacts of the way that our climate is changing. And we've gone from seeing the fires that ravaged so much of the different nations to now seeing earthquake in Morocco and the complete devastation there. And thank God that other nations have said they would go and to help digging out through all of the rubble. And then, of course, the floods that hit Libya and hit Libya so badly. And it has been horrendous to see the scenes that we've seen on the news right in front of us, coming into our living rooms. And we've seen people who are so devastated. They have lost loved ones. They have lost family members. They have lost everything. And they are left with rubble. And the reality is, that it can often be many, many years before any rebuilding happens. Rebuilding has to be financed. People have to get over a sense of loss and grieving before they can already turn their heads back to rebuilding. And we look at the destruction and we often hear of politics in a country that will prevent anything happening in the immediate future. And folks, it is so important that we uphold people in prayer. So important. It's so important that we do whatever we can where opportunity arises. And we pray for those who go in to help as well, because they have hard work and hard tasks and often having to tread a very, very fine line because of the politics of the country. Good on them for having such big hearts. For the people that we were reading about today, generations had passed. And it has to be said that it is often a different generation that has to rebuild. It's very often the people that are on the ground at a particular time that are responsible for the rebuilding. And it may well not be a generation that's there just now, but the younger ones that are coming up that end up with a task of rebuilding. That's exactly what was happening at the time of Nehemiah. Some of the people who had been taken off into exile would have died in exile. Some of them would have been born in exile. And now we have a different generation and they want to go back and they want to rebuild. And there's a very good reason for that. The temple, well, that was a sign of God's presence. The wall was a sign of a holy city. And they have a desire a strong desire for God's presence to be there, for them to be able to praise and worship God in the way that they feel is important to do. And so they go back and they start the work of rebuilding. It's a very, very practical job. They've got a lot of practical things to do. Folks, I have been talking for some time over the last few weeks about the situation that the church is in right now. And I need to make this really, really clear. I'm not just talking about Church of Scotland. I'm talking about the church Christianity in Western society. We know that in other societies where Christianity is managing to break through, it is flourishing and blossoming. But the reality is that in Western society, that is not the case. And it is not just Church of Scotland that finds itself with a decline in membership and attendance. And so as Christians, it is time to rebuild. It is time. We are now the generations that are on the ground. 
We are the ones who God is now calling to rebuild his church. And I don't mean buildings. I mean a people. To rebuild and reestablish something that God can work among, something where God can show his power and his love in our communities. And it is good to be able to look back to see what was happening then. And I'm going back centuries. This was before, long before Jesus was born. So I'm going back a long, long way in time. It's good to be able to see what God did then because we know if God can do that then, he can do it now. And God tends to use the willing of the day. The people who are on the ground and the willing of the day. And it's not a bad idea to have a look and see what was happening. To recognize that yes, there was opposition. And that we will always, always find ourselves coming up against opposition. And sometimes that opposition can be from within. I deliberately didn't read all of Nehemiah. We would have been here for quite a long time if I had done. But it's an interesting book to read. And you'll see that some of the problem was from within their own people. And sometimes the squabbles or the opposition comes from within our own people or from within different denominations, which is nonsense. Because we are all God's people on the ground right now. We're the ones that God is calling to rebuild. And we all have a job to do. But there's also opposition comes from outside. And so it's important that we have a look and we see what happened then. Because then maybe we won't make the same mistakes. We can learn from the mistakes of others. There's a saying that says history always repeats itself. It has to because we never learn. And maybe if we did and we looked at the mistakes that others had made, we could think, okay, we can watch out for that and we can make sure that that doesn't happen. And one of the things that we saw that Nehemiah was keen on doing, it was prayer. And we must never, ever, ever underestimate the importance of prayer. Our personal prayers, our corporate prayers. Before lockdown, We used to have a weekly prayer time. We used to have it in the hall every Tuesday morning. But because of lockdown, we we kind of stopped meeting there. But I need to tell you that after the October holidays, we're going to start that Tuesday morning prayer time again. But it'll be in here. It'll be in here. And it'll be open to anyone who happens to want to come along. And it'll be an opportunity for us to pray for the church, to pray for our nation, to pray for the nations, but also to pray for individuals. Because if we are strong, and if things are going well in our lives, we are more productive for God as well. So prayer has to be a priority. Every single one of us needs to make prayer a priority. We already have a men's prayer group on a Thursday night. We have monthly prayer breakfasts. We need to ensure that we take everything to God in prayer, every situation. But the other thing was, Nehemiah equipped the workers. He equipped them for the job that they were doing, He also equipped them for any of the mishaps that might happen along the way. Notice they were singing that little song about the rubble. Before they could rebuild, they had lots and lots of rubble that had to be moved. Baggage and rubble is always depressing. And for us as a church, sometimes there's baggage and rubble that we need to get pushed to one side. Church of Scotland is doing a massive restructure There are plans happening all over. And those plans will affect Forfa as well. And in our restructuring, we are going to be having a five-way union. We are going to be united with St. Margaret's, with Letham, 
was Aberlemno, Rescobi, and Guthrie. There will be worship centers where a lot of things will be happening. A center to work out of, this will be one. Lethem will be another. Aberlemno will be another. Rescobi will possibly be one to start with, but we need to have a look and see what is possible there. But it means that some buildings will be going. St. Margaret's will be going, and so will Guthrie in the immediate future. And we'll be concentrating on worship elsewhere. We may well use community buildings. If people won't come into church, then we go to where they are. And we need to be ready and equipped for that. And over the coming weeks, we will be talking about that. I might pick up on that one after the October holidays. Or I might have enough time before the October holidays. We'll see how that goes. But whatever, we need to be equipped for the job in hand. And we may need to get rid of some baggage. And we may need to look at how we do things and do things differently. The other thing that he was keen on doing was raising the spirits of the people, and he did this in a special way. He reminded them of who God is. And sometimes we need to be reminded of who God is, of what God has done, of what God has done for his people across the generations, generation after generation after generation. For us especially, in our generation, the fact that he kept his promises, he promised to send someone, his own son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus showing us the way, showing us how to live, the outpouring of God's love. Showing us how God wants us to love. Showing us God's priorities. Teaching us the way forward. And yes, equipping us. Equipping us by the power of the Holy Spirit. That gives us the strength and the focus. And the leadership and the guidance. And the teaching that we need. As we move forward. And the more that we keep in touch with the Holy Spirit through our prayer, through hearing God's word, the stronger we become. The more that we are reminded that we are God's people and we have a wonderful God, the stronger we become. And the more our spirits and the more our faith rises as well and equips us for the task in front of us. And some folks might be here thinking, well, I'm not quite sure what I can do and how I can help. Well, look, it's on there. Prayer is a start, and every single one of us can pray. If we can think, we can pray. And sometimes we may have a special skill, or sometimes we may just be available Remember that the people that were rebuilding the wall, they weren't all builders, they weren't all joiners, they weren't all plasterers. In fact, if we'd read all of Nehemiah, we'd have found that some of them were merchants. Some of them were goldsmiths, and they weren't building the wall out of gold. Some of them were perfumers. You know, so they were all skilled in different ways, but they were all ready and willing to help in whatever way they could. And sometimes the way that you can touch other people for God is just by showing a love and a kindness. We come together corporately so that we hear God's word and our spirits can rise. By the time we get into the New Testament, we start to hear little things like, never give up meeting together. That's important because it helps our spirits to rise and helps us to be equipped for the task ahead. But one thing I know for certain is that if God could do it then, God can do it now. One thing I know for certain that if God could use the people on the ground at that time, God can use us on the ground right now to rebuild his church, 
And it may be in a slightly different way. But to rebuild his church and establish his kingdom. So let's talk to God just now. Let us pray. Loving Lord, as we come to you today, we are very aware of the disasters that have been happening in our world. We are also aware, Lord, that while people are lost in rubble, while people are burying their dead, other world leaders are meeting to discuss how they can arm themselves to cause more destruction. And Lord, we feel helpless in all of these situations, but we love and serve a mighty and powerful God. And may I ask that you would show your power in our world again. Loving Lord, we pray for every single person on the ground, whether they may, may be a survivor who's trying to pick things out of the rubble, or whether they are volunteers, Lord, be with them and help them in the enormous task that they face. Lord, we pray for our own society and for our own country that seems to squabble over the silly things while the enormity of other things, the reality of our own situations still continues. And we ask again that you would show your hand in every situation, in our society, in our churches, in our personal lives. And Lord, we pray that you would equip us as your people on the ground right now, that you would put aside the enemies, the things that would get in our way, the things that would drag us down. Lord, as we look at your word and look at Nehemiah, we could see that not only were people trying to stop the work that was going on, but there were personal attacks on the people at the ground. Lord, you overcame all of that, and we pray that you will overcome that again, that we would see your hand at work. And as they praise God, we too praise you for all that you have done, for all that you are doing, and for all that you are going to do. Loving Lord, we come as your people, but also as individuals, each and every one of us facing our own circumstances, and we ask to see your hand at work in our personal lives, that we would draw close to you, that we would hold on to you, that we would love you better and serve you more. Lord, we ask that as we go about our lives today, as we go for our food, we ask that you would bless those who have prepared for us, who have set up for us. We ask, Lord, that you would be there in our conversations, that we don't leave you behind, but that you are there in our hearts and in our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close by singing another brilliant hymn, At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Bow.
So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you evermore. Amen.